There are two common ways to cross the sea, by plane or by boat. Planes are speedy, but ships offer scenic views. Good ships can sail for over 30 years before being respectfully dismantled. Yet, not all reach this stage. Some get abandoned, leaving behind their unique tales. Join us as we explore the 12 most amazing abandoned ships in the world. Number 12. Shipwreck Beach Lying on the sandy expanse of Long Beach, Nordok in South Africa is the enigmatic SS Kakapo, a schooner-rigged steamship, a ship powered by both sails and an engine. Named after a flightless parrot native to New Zealand, the SS Kakapo was built by the Grangemouth Dockyard Company in Scotland in 1898. Spanning 64 meters in length and 10 meters in width, it was a sizable vessel with a capacity to carry up to 665 tons. The Kakapo's inaugural voyage in 1900 saw it carrying coal from Swansea, Wales, to Sydney, Australia. Helming the ship was the recently certified Danish sailor, Niels Peter Fischer Nicolaisson, backed by a multinational crew of 20 men. After reaching Cape Town on May 24th, the SS Kakapo again set sail for Sydney the next day. A fierce northwesterly gale threw the ship off course, with reduced visibility leading the captain to confuse Chapman's Peak for Cape Point. Realizing the error too late, the ship struck the shore of Long Beach around 9 p.m. The impact split the hull in two and broke off the ship's bow. Fortunately, the crew managed to walk ashore unscathed and were subsequently rescued by local farmers. The captain's shame over his navigational error was so huge that he reputedly lived aboard the wreck for up to three years. Despite this, attempts to refloat the ship failed. And over the years, the sea and sand have claimed most of the SS Kakapo, leaving only fragments of the hull, boiler, ribs, and rudder. Today, the SS Kakapo serves as a haunting attraction for hikers, photographers, and history buffs who visit Long Beach. Depending on the tide and wind conditions, different parts of the ship reveal themselves from beneath the sand. Number 11. Kiptopike Concrete Ships There's something truly remarkable about a fleet of ghostly ships silently resting in the waters of Chesapeake Bay. When you first set eyes on these spectral vessels off Kiptopike Beach, you might wonder how they ended up there, what purpose they serve, and why they're built from concrete of all things. Welcome to the world of the Kiptopiki concrete ships, a curious testament to American wartime ingenuity and the relentless march of time. At first, the idea of concrete ships might seem strange. After all, we're accustomed to thinking of steel as the right choice of shipbuilding material. But back in the time of the Second World War, resources were stretched thin and steel had become both scarce and expensive. The U.S. Maritime Commission found themselves in a predicament how could they build a fleet of ships swiftly and economically? The answer was concrete. It was less costly, readily available, and quick to use in shipbuilding. However, this innovative solution didn't come without its share of drawbacks. The resulting ships were heavy, slow, and more susceptible to cracking compared to their steel counterparts. Out of the fleet of 24 vessels that were constructed, only 12 saw service during the war, mostly serving as supply and fuel carriers. After the war ended, some were scrapped, while others found their way into the hands of private owners. One such private owner was the Virginia Ferry Corporation. They bought nine concrete ships in 1948 and set an intriguing plan into motion. The ships were towed to Kiptopiki Beach, where they were partially sunk in a line parallel to the shore. The intention wasn't to discard these old war horses, but to put them to use as a breakwater, providing a protective barrier against waves and storms for the ferry terminal. But these concrete giants also unintentionally served another purpose. They became an artificial reef, offering a thriving habitat for a diverse range of marine life, including fish, crabs, oysters. They also became a haven for birds, turning into a nesting site. By 1964, the ferry service was no longer operational, superseded by the opening of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Yet these concrete behemoths remained, emerging as both a historical landmark and a recreational attraction. The concrete fleet has nine vessels and each was named in honor of pioneers who significantly contributed to the development and science of concrete. These ships, 
ranging from 366 to 369 feet in length and from 54 to 56 feet in width, are now silent yet intriguing custodians of a fascinating slice of American engineering and maritime history. Number 10. The Steam Trawler Sheraton The Steam Trawler Sheraton's wreck is a fascinating sight on the beach at St. Edmund's Point in Norfolk, England. Built in 1907, the Sheraton was a fishing ship serving in both world wars as a patrol boat and minesweeper. Its wrecking happened in 1947, used as a target ship for naval training until then. Constructed with metal plates, ribs, and rivets, the Sheraton was one of the many steam trawlers designed to tackle the North Sea's harsh conditions in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It had a steam-powered engine and was about 130 feet long and 23 feet wide. It was built to carry around 10 crew members and up to 50 tons of fish. The Sheraton was launched by Cook, Welton, and Gemmel Lutend in Beverly near Hull, starting its service by fishing from Grimsby, its initial home port. However, it soon joined military service as the Royal Navy requisitioned trawlers for anti-submarine duties and minesweeping during the First World War. The Sheraton was equipped with a boom defense device and a gun for self-defense and signaling. It survived the war and resumed fishing, only to be called again by the Royal Navy for the Second World War in 1939. After the Second World War, the Sheraton's life took a turn. It was painted bright yellow and used for naval training exercises as a target ship. However, in April of 1947, the Sheraton drifted from its moorings due to strong winds and ran aground on Old Hunstanton's beach, where it's found even today. Nowadays, the Sheraton's rusted hull attracts locals and tourists at low tide. It's a point of archaeological interest signifying a crucial period in naval history and trawler construction. The Sheraton's wreck is under the Protection of Wrecks Act of 1973, making it illegal to remove or damage it without official permission. The wreck also serves as a habitat for marine life, such as crabs, seaweed, barnacles, and fish. Number 9. USS Sachem Have you ever come across something that seems utterly out of place and yet there it is? Imagine you're cruising down the Ohio River and off in the distance you spot something unusual. The silhouette of a ship standing silent and solitary. That would be the USS Sachem, a ship as unusual as the circumstance it finds itself in today. The story begins at the turn of the 20th century. The year was 1902 when the ship initially named the Kelt slid off the assembly line and into the water for the first time. She was a luxury steam yacht, a testament to the opulence of the era, custom-built by the Pusey and Jones Company in Wilmington, Delaware, for a wealthy businessman, John Rogers Maxwell. With its two masts, two deckhouses, and a staggering nine staterooms, the Kelt was designed to make a statement. However, with World War I in 1917, the ship was drafted into service by the U.S. Navy, which saw potential in the vessel beyond pleasure cruises. The Kelt was transformed into a patrol vessel, complete with guns and depth charges, and given a new name, the USS Sachem. The end of the war saw the Sachem decommissioned and repurposed again, this time, to a sightseeing boat named the Sightseer. However, perhaps the most intriguing chapter in her history was yet to come. In 1922, the Sightseer was chartered by none other than the world-renowned inventor Thomas Edison. Edison had plans for the ship, turning it into a floating laboratory for his experiments on submarine detection. Various instruments, from microphones to oscilloscopes, were installed on the ship. Despite spending several months aboard, conducting a series of tests and trials, Edison's results, while promising, were not quite conclusive. Fast forward to 1929, the sightseer was sold again and assumed a new identity as the Circle Line 5th, a part of the sightseeing fleet operating around Manhattan Island. For decades, she served as a floating testament to the beauty of New York, offering countless tourists and locals a unique perspective of the skyline and landmarks. However, this period of stability was not to last forever. In 1987, the Circle Line 5th was retired and bought by Robert Miller, a retired teacher from Kentucky. With a dream to restore the ship to its original glory, Miller towed the ship to his property on the Ohio River. Unfortunately, Miller's ambitious project was not to be. 
He faced an array of challenges, from legal disputes and financial troubles to vandalism and theft, and the project was eventually abandoned. Today, the USS Sachem, this ghost ship, remains where Miller left it, rusting and decaying on the riverbank. Number 8. SS Mahino The SS Mahino is not just an ordinary ship. It's a tale of transformations and unexpected endings. Born in Scotland in 1905, the Mahino was created to serve as a high-class passenger ship for the Union Company of New Zealand. It was advanced for its time, a turbine-driven steamer equipped with a range of luxuries like a grand piano, a smoking room, and more. Yet, in 1914, the world was plunged into World War I, and the elegant SS Mahino had to trade its luxury for utility. Funds were raised to turn it into a floating hospital, marked by a white coat of paint, green stripe, and red crosses. The ship hosted eight wards, two operating theaters, and a medical team ready to tend to wounded soldiers. It served in the Gallipoli Campaign, moving casualties from France to England across the English Channel, and provided medical support to over 9,000 patients. But the Mahino wasn't done changing. After the war ended in 1918, it returned to its original duty as an ocean liner sailing between Australia and New Zealand. This continued until 1935, when it was sold for scrap. But fate had other plans. While being towed to Japan, a violent storm broke the tow line, and the Mahino was left adrift off Australia's coast. While the crew survived the ordeal, the ship wasn't so lucky. Attempts to refloat it failed, and it was abandoned on Fraser Island, where it lies today. The SS Mahino's rusting remains, now a striking tourist attraction, echo the stories of its past, from being a luxury liner to a hospital ship, and finally, a shipwreck. Visitors can view it from a distance, owing to its delicate state and potential asbestos contamination. This maritime relic, each rusted crevice and weather-beaten plank, narrates a tale of extraordinary transformation and resilience. Number 7. Homebush Bay The uniqueness of Homebush Bay lies in its shipwrecks, relics of an erstwhile shipbreaking yard active from the 1960s to the 1970s. These silent hulks, now a part of the picturesque Bicentennial Park, are visible from various walking and cycling trails that trace the bay's shoreline. Going back in time, we find that in the early 20th century, Homebush Bay was a bustling port and industrial hub. During the dark days of the Second World War, it served as a naval base and a munitions depot. Post-war, it morphed into a final resting place for ships no longer required, where they were either scrapped dismantled or employed as storage units for explosives or toxic waste. Several companies, including Standard Brothers Launch and Tug Company, Union Steamship Company, and Cockatoo Docks and Engineering Company, ran the shipbreaking yard. However, as the 70s rolled in, the shipbreaking industry saw a steep decline. Faced with environmental concerns, safety issues, and fierce competition from overseas, the yard had to shut down in 1976. Consequently, many ships that were midway through the scrapping process were abandoned. It wasn't until the creation of the Bicentennial Park in 1988, as part of Australia's Bicentennial celebrations, that these shipwrecks came into the public eye. Today, the shipwrecks of Homebush Bay are appreciated as historical and cultural treasures and ecological habitats. Five main shipwrecks decorate the bay's waters. First is the SS Airfield. This steel-hulled steam collier built in 1911 used to carry coal between Newcastle and Sydney. During World War II, it functioned as a supply ship. Then there's the SS Mortlake Bank. Constructed in 1924, this steam collier also transported coal and other goods. The HMS Karangi is also found there. It was built in 1941. This steel boom defense vessel was used to lay anti-submarine nets around harbors and ports during the war. Then there's the SS Heroic. This wooden-hulled tugboat, dating back to 1909, was used to tow barges and ships around Sydney Harbour. And lastly, we have an unknown shipwreck. This unidentified wooden-hulled vessel is nestled near the SS Heroic, hidden by surrounding mangroves. Number 6. Mary D. Hume Have you ever heard of Mary D. Hume? The echoes of a bygone era emanate from this historic shipwreck, anchored near the mouth of the Rogue River in Oregon. If you cross the Highway 101 bridge, you can't help but notice this vessel, once mighty and busy, now silent and partially submerged. 
The Mary D. Hume was built in the year 1881 in Gold Beach, Oregon. This maritime workhorse clocked an impressive 97 years in service, in various roles that illustrate the diverse facets of marine labor during that period. Its name is a nod to Mary Duncan Hume, the wife of R. D. Hume. R. D. was a trailblazer, an early businessman who set up a fish cannery in Gold Beach, which was then known as Ellensburg. The ship itself, built from local timber, had a colossal keel measuring 10 inches by 36 inches by 140 feet long. This hefty piece was known as the largest stick of square timber ever floated down Rogue River. The machinery of the Mary D. Hume was salvaged from the wrecked steamer Varuna, and its planking was secured with wooden pegs. The construction of this ship was a testament to both the resources and the ingenuity of the time. In its initial years, the Mary D. Hume was a busy cargo ship, ferrying goods between San Francisco and Gold Beach. But its fate took an interesting turn in 1889 when the Pacific Steam Whaling Company purchased it. The ship was re-rigged as a brigantine and then embarked on adventurous whaling expeditions in the Arctic. These voyages were quite profitable. Just to give you an idea, its first expedition spanning from 1890 to 1892 caught 37 whales, earning a whopping cargo worth $400,000. By the dawn of the 20th century, Mary D. Hume had switched roles again, serving as a cannery tender for the Northwest Fisheries Company in Alaska. It survived sinking in ice and went through multiple renovations, including the installation of new engines. Eventually, in either 1906 or 1908, the ship began working for the American Tugboat Company of Everett, Washington, hauling logs and barges on Puget Sound. Mary D. Hume retired in 1977, and plans were made to restore it as a museum piece. However, fate had other plans. In 1985, the ship sank in the Rogue River, where it remains as a reminder of the past, a silent sentinel on the shoreline. The ship even found its place on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. While exploring, one of them spotted something unusual beneath the clear waters. They leaned over and couldn't believe their eyes. It was a shipwreck. Its wooden remnants were peeking out of the sand, and you could see the rusty anchor. The friends were thrilled but puzzled. How did it get here? Whose ship was it? Why has no one claimed the wreckage? Can you help us solve this mystery? The answers await. Remember to comment down below. Number 5. Peter Iredale Can you imagine a shipwreck becoming a historic landmark? This is the case with the Peter Iredale, one of the most long-lasting and accessible shipwrecks nestled in the graveyard of the Pacific within the boundaries of Fort Stevens State Park in North Oregon. This area earned its eerie title due to being the final resting place for around 2,000 ships since 1792. The Peter Iredale, a four-masted sailing vessel, has a story worth sharing. Constructed in Maryport, England in 1890, it was named after its owner, Peter Iredale. The ship was quite the sight, with royal sails above double-top and top-gallant sails, a commercial marvel it carried coal, iron, and wheat across the world's oceans. However, in the early morning of October 25, 1906, the vessel's fate took a tragic turn. The ship was heading towards Portland, Oregon, when it encountered a fog so thick that it lost sight of the entrance to the Columbia River. Despite efforts to steer the ship away, the strong wind and current proved too strong. The Peter Iredale ran aground on Clatsop Sands, snapping off three of its masts. After the crew made desperate attempts to lighten the ship, it was clear the vessel was stuck. Captain Lawrence ordered the crew to abandon ship. Thanks to a lifeboat from nearby Hammond, Oregon, all sailors were safely evacuated with no loss of life. Though the ship was relatively undamaged, it never made it back to the sea. Over time, it tilted and settled firmly in the sands. Today, the shipwreck's remnants, its bow, ribs, and masts, are iconic landmarks in Fort Stevens State Park. Despite its rusting exterior and ever-changing appearance due to sand and tide levels, the Peter Iredale's remains continue to captivate visitors. Number 4. Francisco Morazan If you're ever near Lake Michigan's South Manitou Island, you may spot the brooding form of the Francisco Morazan. This vessel's fascinating journey began in 1922 when it was constructed in Germany by Deutsche Werft AG Hamburg. 
Named Arcadia, this ship started its life serving the Mediterranean and Black Sea ports, boasting a length of 234 feet and 5 inches and a breadth of 36 feet and 8 inches, this mighty vessel had a draft of 16 feet 6 and a half inches, with a net tonnage of 747 and the capacity to carry a dead weight of 2,091, it was a substantial ship for its time. The ship's life took many turns. In 1934, it was sold and renamed Elbing. Six years later, during World War II, it was seized by Germany's Navy, the Kriegsmarine. By 1945, it was captured by the Allies and renamed again, this time as Empire Congress. After the war, the vessel became the Bruns under the Norwegian government's management. Following a series of sales and name changes, it was finally renamed Francisco Morazan in 1958 under a Greek owner. Registered in Monrovia, Liberia, the ship was operated by the West Indies Transport Company. The final journey of Francisco Morazan was a tragic one. On November 27, 1960, the ship left Chicago loaded with 940 tons of merchandise, heading for Rotterdam. The young captain, Eduardo Trevisas, was at the helm, and his pregnant wife, Anastasia, was by his side. Unfortunately, the next day brought a brutal storm. The ship, battered by the elements, ran aground off South Manitou Island's southwest shore. Despite maintaining contact with the Coast Guard, the crew had to wait for rescue. It was clear the ship was lost. The crew left the vessel in early December, with Captain Trivizas's wife airlifted to safety. Today, Francisco Morazan's wreck lies abandoned, a reminder of the past. Number 3. M.V. Captayanis. Stranded on a sandbank in the Firth of Clyde, Scotland, the M.V. Captayanis, also known as the Sugar Boat, life on the sea ended on the 27th of January in 1974 from transporting sugar from East Africa to the Tate and Lyle refinery in Greenock. The sugar boat now stands as a fascinating symbol of maritime history. The storm that fateful night was intense. The sugar boat, caught in its fury, couldn't stay anchored. The ship began drifting ominously toward another vessel, the BP tanker British Light. A dreadful collision took place, and the tanker's anchor chains tore through the sugar boat's hull like a beast's claws. With the hull breached, the seawater rushed in. Amid this terrifying situation, Captain Theodorakis Ionis demonstrated impressive courage and quick thinking. He decided to deliberately run the ship aground on a nearby sandbank, hoping to save his crew. The captain's calculated gamble paid off. Every single one of the 30 crew members was rescued, with a convoy of tugs and pilot boats arriving to aid them. However, when morning came and the tide retreated, the sugar boat lay on its side and sank into the sands of Clyde. Over four decades later, the sugar boat remains a sight to behold. Visible from many towns and villages in the Upper Firth and the coastal railway line between Glasgow and Helensburg, the ship's rusted body has become a local landmark. Built in Denmark in 1946 and initially named Norden, it wasn't until 1963, under Greek ownership, that the ship was named Captianus. But to locals and those who view it from the shore, it's the Sugar Boat, a moniker that even inspired a local restaurant. Captianus translates to Captain John in Greek, a tribute to the captain who made a brave decision on that stormy night. Number 2. HMVS Cerberus Unveiling the mysteries beneath the sea has always held a certain fascination. Among the hidden gems nestled in the waters of Half Moon Bay near Melbourne, Australia, one stands out, the wreckage of a once mighty warship, the HMVS Cerberus. The ship was a product of the Palmer's Shipbuilding and Iron Company in Jarrow, England. Charles Paisley supervised its construction, and Edward Reed, the Royal Navy's chief constructor, designed it. This was no ordinary ship. Reed included cutting-edge features such as steam propulsion, rotating guns in turrets, and an armored belt and breastwork. Now, imagine the spectacle in 1871 when the HMVS Cerberus arrived in Port Phillip Bay, Melbourne, after a five-month journey from England. The spectacle was grand, complete with a 21-gun salute from the shore batteries. From then on, it became the flagship of the Victorian naval forces, which boasted a fleet of two frigates, several gunboats, and a torpedo corps. Interestingly, despite its formidable presence, the ship was primarily used for training and coastal patrols and never had a chance to flex its might in combat. As Australia moved towards Federation in 1901, the Cerberus found itself transferred to the Commonwealth Naval Forces. 
A decade later, it was renamed HMS Cerberus, commemorating the formation of the Royal Australian Navy. However, the once proud warship was showing its age. Outdated and worn, the ship was demoted to serve as a guard ship and munitions store at the Williamstown Naval Depot. In 1921, its role changed again as it became HMAS Platypus II and served as a submarine tender for the six J-class submarines based in Geelong. The final voyage for the Cerberus came in 1924, when it was sold to a salvage company for a meager 409 pounds. Stripped of its valuable components such as guns, turrets, engines, boilers, and fittings, the ship was then scuttled as a breakwater in Half Moon Bay to safeguard a local yacht club. The ship's once formidable hull and turrets were reduced to relics partially submerged in three meters of water. With time, the HMVS Cerberus took on a new life, transforming into an artificial reef teeming with marine life, attracting species like fish, crabs, sea stars, sponges, corals, and seaweeds. Recognizing its historical importance, in 2005, the shipwreck was added to the Victorian Heritage Register and the National Heritage List. Number 1. La Famille Express In the shallow waters of the Caicos Banks near the island of Providencial in the Turks and Caicos Islands, lies the eerie shipwreck of the La Famille Express. The tale of this ship dates back to 1952. Its birthplace was a shipyard in Poland, where it was designed and built as a service vessel to aid the mighty Soviet Navy. Bearing the name Fort Shevchenko, it served dutifully, transporting supplies to offshore oil rigs. Interestingly, it was also an indirect witness to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, a tense chapter in the annals of global history. The turn of the century in 1999 ushered in a new phase for the vessel. It changed hands and took on the name La Famille Express. The ship embarked on a new journey as a freighter under the Panama flag, operating within the mesmerizing expanse of the Caribbean Sea. Its new duty was to carry bulk rock and other cargoes across the waves, a crucial cog in the maritime supply chain. However, in 2004, the La Famille Express faced the greatest opponent of all time, Mother Nature's fury. Hurricane Francis, a formidable storm, assailed the Turks and Caicos Islands with ferocious winds and monstrous waves. Anchored securely at the South Dock area of Providencial, or so it seemed, the La Famille Express was defenseless against the storm. As the tempest raged, the ship broke free from its anchor, a victim to the wind's might and the wave's whims. It drifted into the open sea, embarking on a 12-mile journey, approximately 19 kilometers, before finally running aground on a reef about 2 miles, or 3.2 kilometers, off Long Bay Beach on the southeast side of the island. After this unanticipated journey, the La Famille Express was left abandoned by its owner. With no one to tend to its needs, the ship was left at the mercy of the salt water. The once busy freighter evolved into a rusty, lonely sight, a silhouette against the vast expanse of the sea. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.